Hi, welcome to today's show. Right, this one's going to be quite different. We're going to have a bit of a laugh with this. So um, I'm here with uh, a number of um, guests that we're going to give you some insight in moving from prototype to startup. Uh, this is part of the hashtag 2020 vision hack brought to you by Aislink and Intel. We've got Raymond uh, Lowe from Intel, Stuart Christie, Zoe and Shivy. Um, sadly, Shivy's having camera issues, which isn't great for a computer vision one, is it really? <laughs> so but we, the irony, apologies yes. on that. <laughs> Hi guys, how are you doing? <laughs> doing great. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> yeah, you can sponsor him on the webcam one day. <laughs> <laughs> Shivy's oh, cameras Shivy connected. Camera. <laughs> Shivy's cameras connected to a Vizzy doing some work at the moment. <laughs> yes. Let's go with that. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, okay, so if you've got any questions as we're going through this in um, helping uh, asking any questions about moving from prototype to being a startup, uh, we've all got some war wounds in doing this and we're really keen to share that insight. So just make a comment on whichever platform you're on and we'll um, share that comment live and we'll answer you throughout the show. Um, so I think we'll go into, first of all, a bit of an introduction from everybody and the startup um, that they've got some insight on. So let's start with Raymond. Great. Thank you, Paul. Been a while. Haven't talked for a while. Well, so my background. So I came from Canada, actually. I'm Canadian, guys. So about eight to nine years ago, I forgot. Been a while. Uh, I actually took a prototype for my PhD and went to California, Silicon Valley. So I actually did a startup from a backpack style. So first thing I did that time, we actually did a marketing launch with a Kickstarter with my co-founder. So it was like one of those things, your PhD students stuck in the lab is like, oh, marketing, it's like new, right? And we did that on augmented reality. So that was my first journey into like the Silicon Valley road, I'll call it the road. Mm -hmm. uh, so we did a Kickstarter with a, not that successful, a couple hundred thousand, pretty good, but pretty we good. moved to YC. So we, because of that momentum, we got into Y Combinator in Silicon Valley. And that time mm -hmm. it was like, okay, I'm getting my flight ticket. So I took my backpack, I took the demo, and then stopped my PhD, and then <laughs> flew all the way to California. I was like, let's try for three months. But every day, I never went back home already. So that's why I'm still here, guys. So that was my <laughs> real start life. Uh, so in YC, uh, we start like doing all those campaigns, and we mm -hmm. really crazy. We went like from that, I don't know, 200K that we raised from the uh, Kickstarter to uh, yeah. 1.5 million sales. And there wow. we uh, have five people in the basements doing all this video editing. Mm -hmm. But that time, Oculus got sold for two billion, guys. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> but it could have been you. <laughs> I can't believe it. Like, we were trying to fundraise like a couple hundred thousand, couple hundred thousand during that time. But all of a sudden, yeah. 23 million, Series A. We closed it in six months. So I was like there, I was like, okay, what should I do? Let's be CTO. Literally, I was like, let me be the CTO, right? I joined as like yeah. a co-founder. I was like, let me try that out. But that time I took it all the way. I was like, okay, let's start hiring. So summarize it shorter. That journey took me from five people to 150. Mm -hmm. uh, and I hired over, I don't know, a couple hundred people in my life during that three to four wow. years. Uh, and then I raised a Series B too. I didn't just ship one, but I shipped two products. So both of them are augmented reality headset. And the name of the company was Meta. So you may have seen me from TED Talk at one point next to Microsoft HoloLens. That was me. It was crazy. I was the first HoloLens there back then. Uh, wow. But in short, I think um, that whole startup experience taught me everything I didn't see in my school, uh, which is mm -hmm. like a test of my prototype to real user. And mm -hmm. then yeah, I still have a lot more, but I will stop there. I still have an inner startup story and then some pre startup story, but I'll stop right there. That's one of the cool ones that I can talk whole day long. Okay, next. No, it, th thanks for sharing that. I mean, that is really interesting. You've you've certainly gone through uh, the the journey uh, as we've discussed um, previously as well. So it's great to share that insight. Uh, thanks, Raymond. Um, Chevy, um, little intro from yourself. Sure. So uh, hi everyone. Um, my background is uh, I'm a neuroscientist and a bioengineer uh, based in Australia, I mean, in Melbourne. Um, and so I started my career as a research engineer working for four years to help build Australia's first bionic eye. So this is a little chip 
that sits inside the eye to help blind people see. So got some amazing job satisfaction with that job. And more importantly, got to, to learn a ton about biological vision uh, and hence why I have moved into machine vision now. So I, I finished off that gig, uh, decided to do a PhD in computer science and computer vision, mm -hmm. uh, worked at IBM research for a few years, and then I decided that I, I wanted to start a, my own company. Uh, but pretty much finishing off the uh, Bionic Eye project, uh, that project sadly ended because we ran out of funding because the Americans beat us. <laughs> um, but I'm glad to report that the project's back in action thanks to some recent oh, funding. Wow. So I guess that's... the lesson for the guys listening is don't run out of money. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> yep. I think that's I think that's the big lesson, and I think we can end the show right there. Don't <laughs> run out of money. <laughs> oh, wait, wait. A good question: Have you talked to Steve Mann, Professor Steve Mann, the father of wearable ever? No, I haven't. Okay, you should because he built one. That what you talk about. Anyway, oh, nice. back to you. Back to you. Nice. We should connect. That's exactly what Starbucks about. Make yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, Make so it happen. Yeah. Lesson lesson number two is connection, networking, getting to know people in your field as well as outside um, as customers. Um, lesson number one is uh, don't run out of money. Uh, Zoe. <laughs> Hello, everyone. My name is Zoe Caetano. I'm also in Silicon Valley. I'm in San Francisco. Um, I actually started my journey in uh, university while I was studying applied physics and business at the same time. And I've always been drawn to the entrepreneurial route. Um, so I started um, a, a company with a couple of other uh, students outside of our university. Um, we actually met in Turin, Italy, um, at an incubator program in Europe. And we came from all sorts of universities, from Texas, from Canada, from Italy. Um, and we were drawn to the idea of we wanted to make the music experience better. And so what we decided to do was create emotion detection technology in, uh, with headphones. So we uh, started into the, in this four-week incubator program where we had to create a prototype in after week one. And so we had networked with a company called Bragi. And at the time, they had a, a Kickstarter program also running in Europe. And so they had they, we asked them to ship us a couple of test units so that we can put our EEG <laughs> sensors into them and test out the viability of having emotion detecting headphones that doesn't explode. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Lesson. I don't I had. That was crazy hard. I think there's a lesson there. Lesson number three. Don't make things that blow up unless it's military. Especially when you're putting it uh, on, on your, your head. On your head. <laughs> <laughs> funnily, funnily enough, uh, a certain company that uh, heads phone that I'm wearing right now, Orange Electronics, um, they may be interested in having a chat with you about that, <laughs> as long as it doesn't explode. <laughs> you, you know, it's like, you know, ah, all right, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, we're getting a, we're getting an interesting response from the audience today. <laughs> Thanks for cash. I don't know. Okay. Um, so how it ended was we created a prototype during that incubator program, and then we actually went on Kickstarter and Indiegogo as well to test out the viability even more. And that's mm -hmm. what I'll talk about is finding the right product uh, market fit because we were too distracted into so many verticals and industries. We wanted yeah. to use it for user research when users are going through websites and apps and reviewing, or we wanted to do it in market research and all sorts of stuff. So we were kind of scrabbling into multiple yeah. different use cases just to shoehorn this one idea. Of we, we love the technology and we wanted to find all sorts of use cases for it. So uh, I'll talk more about that as well. Brilliant. Thanks, Zoe. Uh, Stuart, would you sure. like to share? Yeah, sure. Um, so I've actually been at uh, a couple of startups. Um, one of them was in the UK um, and uh, I was employee number 35 when we got up to 105 and then we were too successful and the competition bought us and closed us down. Um, they wanted the technology. <laughs> so that's just lesson number four. <laughs> lesson number four. That was really what happened. Yeah, they, they and then they shipped the uh, the manufacturing to Turin in Italy, um, which is why I ended up in America. 
Um, I still have the Scottish <laughs> accent, but I'm in Arizona right now. Um, it's going to be 80 degrees here, so that's the real reason I'm in Arizona. Um, yeah, we yeah. we all know why you've left Scotland, Stuart. Yep. It's the weather. <laughs> it's the weather, yeah. But um, when I came to America, uh, after a couple of jobs here, I joined a small startup um, that was a U.S. office for a uh, German software company. Um, mm. So... Um, there was just the two of us, or let's say one and a half of us, uh, to get it going because um, the accountant was the, the the wife of the starter or the uh, CTO who worked part time doing the, the finances. So we only needed so two and a half people started the company, um, and that was uh, that was reasonably successful. Um, we were we had a product that we were now using to bring effectively to a to a prototype um, in the US. So it was like. Um, something that had been funded by uh, Siemens um, in Germany, um, we were now trying to take worldwide. Um, mm -hmm. So that was a, a, a different sort of startup for me than, uh, than start building something. What was that product again? What was that um, product? It, it, was, um, it started off as being the alternative compiler to the Intel compiler. Um, <gasps> So Siemens, <laughs> keep going, keep going. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm listening. Like, uh, uh, keep going. Yeah. So Siemens, Siemens got a license to build their one eight sixes and two eight sixes, I think, in in these you know, old days. But they also wanted a second source uh, compiler instead of just the Intel compiler. And what um, happened now? Um, it was successful enough that um, you no know, Intel ultimately bought the company, the German company. Um, Ooh, okay. I, I jumped ship before then and joined Intel, but six months later, everybody else came along. So, and joined so, everybody followed you over. Stuart, I have to ask the question: Did everybody else follow over with a bit of a golden pot? Um, <laughs> actually, the way the stock prices were going, I actually made out slightly better than they did. Ah, well, there you oh. go. So, so <laughs> lesson, five, lesson number five, no one to do. <laughs> no one to do. <laughs> Learn how to exit. You know, that's exactly what I'm exit. Find the right exit. There's my next exit. I don't care. Jump. Yeah. Oh, I'm going to quickly jump onto Canva and make an image with the right exit. <laughs> okay. Um, so that leaves me. Um, I've, I've done a few startups over the years um, uh, in uh, part-time uh, capacity as well as full-time. Um, one of my favorite ones and one of the ones I'm very passionate about is the one called Mechanics, which was funded by Tartar Communications. Um, and that was um, making um, super SIM cards using Roman connectivity for IoT, but with really interesting APIs that um, I don't know anybody who's really doing that still yet. Um, that has, uh, I, I was number two um, and um, moving on to other projects and stuff, I sort of moved away. from the it's a, a sim iot sim card global sim card with api configuration so you could um monitor and manage um bandwidth move it for, across networks depending on the bandwidth you could manage the accounts and all sorts of stuff still relevant, really powerful it's still huge, relevant, huge, I still... hugely relevant hugely yes. relevant um if you look at stuff like twilio and such like and what they're doing that they're, mm -hmm. they're, they're they're getting close to it close to it um they've, they've released some really cool stuff recently wait, wait, wait so um, that's one what's the second one you said multiple. Uh, yeah, I'm not. I'm not going to talk about someone. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know about you know, about, you know about this one. There's legal implications on that one. <laughs> I'm not going to talk about it. Not bad, by the way. Not for me, but for others. But um, I, I went through a learning. Okay, I went through a learning curve for the taxi application well before Uber, um, which um, again going down to um, choosing the right relationships at the start mm -hmm. is key. And I learned the hard way on choosing the wrong relationships. Got you. Uh, right. But it was a learning curve. It's all good. Don't worry. Um, don't worry. We'll, we'll get you some beers. So don't be sad. Don't be sad. That's okay. So. This is almost like this is almost like startup aholics, isn't it? Really, you know, we're all sat around. Oh, the wounds, the wounds. Yeah, I know. I, know. <laughs> I talk about AR. I talk about reality headset. I built two. But I did many things. I did like a mobile app that was an Instagram, guys. I should show that so many years ago. I did that way <laughs> before Instagram, right? It took off. I did a medical company too. I talk about it later, but it was at Harvard. It was pretty crazy too. Anyway, back to you all. But hold on, let's summarize what we have here. So I have hardware software building experience. We have Bionic Eyes. We have SOE also with a hardware and software headset, right? EEG. Mm -hmm. uh, we have compiler, Stewart. 
Now it's Intel. Makes competitors. sense. Competitors <laughs> and competitors. <laughs> and Paul is an IoT expert. I was like, you literally build a SIM card for us, right? Trying to build a SIM card for us. All right. All so about I think that's a good. I think, <laughs> it's, I think it's yeah, sure. So let's move on to the lessons learned um, and share that with the viewers. So uh, Ray. Um, what's what's the key lesson that you've learned that you'd like to share? Mm, yeah, so I talk about scaling a lot. So I'm the one of those makes no sense kind of startup that get a lot of money in short amount of time with a market demand and everyone loves you. So uh, my story, I'll say first, you know, you know how you have a big warning sign. I don't know, can you put a warning sign for me here? Warning, warning. Only apply to this type of. It's scale, coming. Right? It's coming. It's coming. <laughs> right. So uh, I'll say my lesson were the biggest pain I had was hiring, it was scaling, right? So if you had 23 million in the pot, and you have a product to ship, and you promise a Kickstarter, people say, in 12 months, you're gonna have it. Not gonna happen, guys. <laughs> 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 so the way I think the lesson I learned is, first, when you promise something, you have to keep your customer always up to date, even you fail, like, like doesn't matter that you're delaying, don't ever hide. They will find you, they will hunt you down, no matter what. So always keep the communication there. But the hiring is actually one of the key points that changed me from an engineer, mm -hmm. like I was a PhD student, to an executive in leadership over time. Because like I onboard like so many crazy students in the beginning. Mm -hmm. We all live in the big house. It was crazy. Well, you, all like lived, you all live together? Yeah, we did. <laughs> So, so it is literally like that TV show, isn't it? Yeah, uh, well, I was, uh, if you Google me at uh, TechCrunch and for Meta, TechCrunch and Meta, you find my house. I was in a mansion <laughs> with a swimming pool outside. And then I went to my bedroom to see my place. We have like swimming pool, a tennis court, a basket, we have everything in the big house in the mountains in the Silicon Valley. So the hiring that time was so difficult. Because everyone that joined us were most likely the students. They had no experience. They don't know mm -hmm. what they're doing as well. But that energy, however, helped us to create a lot of momentum. So each of the time I'm hiring very, very great people, like people work with uh, at Google Tensor. I'm oh, sorry, uh, Tango was like the tracking camera. Mm -hmm. At that time, the tablet, right? So we hired the VP for there. Uh, I hire, uh, oh my God, so many engineers. Like I talked to the best professor in the world on the SLAM, which is the tracking. SLAM is like simultaneous localization and mapping. You know how you move your phone, it knows where you are? I got the best professor there. I was like, oh yeah. my God, life changing. That guy just taught me everything that I never know in my life. It took me another 20 years of PhD in that. I'm maybe 50 because I never finished. Uh, so, so that was like, Read the book. Guy. I read too many books in my life. I have a library at home. And I have a new theory we will debate later, but let's get back to it. <laughs> Brilliant. Thanks. Thanks yeah, for sharing. So my me. lesson were you will go through a lot of scaling pain, but identifying the right people and put so much energy to convince that person was one of the hardest jobs as a founder. You are the person ensuring that the culture, the value fit, there's so many lessons there, right? But that process of getting the person to trust you to be working on the same project with you, with a, you know, a start, your financial return is like up to your pitch, right? Like, Stuart knows, you know, like the guy comes like, yeah, my company is worth a billion. I like, sure, everyone said the same thing. <laughs> but it's, 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 I think it's, I think what I'm hearing from you here is it's about um, building the team around you and giving them a north in yes. direction of what you're trying to accomplish and what your vision is. Um, yeah, but when you go from one to a hundred, like, yeah. like you, one, you, like, you have like thousand people looking at you. How do you go from that to that? And it's also about communication in um, enabling um, others to when when there is a pivot based on validation, um, then um, getting people on that journey and understanding the feedback on why that decision's being made as well, especially in the early days. Um, and yes, and well, hold on. actually, very important. One 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 mm -hmm. sim one simple line. All right, learn how to hire and learn how to fire. That's the executive hardest thing ever in my life. Talk to me about that later. Not today. <laughs> it's the hardest decision ever, but those two decisions is how you build a team, right? How do you get, yeah. how do you remove, how do you add and remove? It's a very interesting process. And that's why I learned. Yeah. Back to you guys. Okay, brilliant. Thanks, Raymond. Thanks for sharing that. Uh, Shivi, lessons learned. Yeah, sure. So um, similar to Ray regarding scale, 
I'm assuming many of you listening want to build successful computer vision startups. And mm -hmm. maybe you've started with a proof of concept that seems to be doing okay. But the sad reality is that most computer vision POCs don't scale. And to be successful, you need to build things and scale. So I think, Paul, there's definitely a lesson there. Uh, yeah. Now, the main cause is that your models don't generalize well in different environments. Um, so the lesson here is you should test generalizability early on. Uh, otherwise, you'll end up with a science project that dies along with your startup. So it's very important to test that ability to scale sooner than later. How do you do that? Actually, maybe that's the line. Like, how would you yeah, think about that? You should absolutely right. So most people start off with one model they train on some public data set, then they test it on a camera, but then they kind of stop there. You yeah. need to test generalizability by testing it out on as many. You take that camera and you you test it out in so many different locations. You try it on different cameras. Um, that's, that's what I mean by testing generalizability. Sir, <laughs> since you don't have a camera, that's exactly scalable. You need a minimum of two cameras. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Or you move the camera around a lot. Yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Redundancies, yeah. I think that's one thing I learned when I was working on hardware stuff. So you have to find what happened if it doesn't work? Like what's the like alternative path all the time? Anyway, that's, that's great. Yeah. Brilliant. Thanks. Thanks, Jivy. Uh, just, a, yep. just a quick hi to uh, Ryland. Uh, hi there, buddy. Uh, thanks for joining us today. Um, okay, moving on to Zoe. We'd also Lessons love learned. to know where, where you're coming from. What use cases are you working on? We'd love to hear from the audience as well. What yep. projects yep. are you working on? That, that would be really interesting. Um, so for me, less, biggest lessons learned, lesson learned is to get uh, market validation really quickly. And that's why we learned early on having a prototype after a week was um, it, what we actually did was pre, uh, we wanted to pre-sale the, the technology beforehand. And so we went on Indiegogo and get, get crowdfunding really quickly because then you could see that there's actually a market demand for it. And do competitor research as well because if a competitor is doing it, that means there's a customer and there's a market yeah. for it and uh, be able to pivot really quickly. Um, like I told you earlier, like we were doing multiple different applications because we were so in love with the technology. And mm -hmm. I have a feeling that you may be in a similar boat as well. Like you love computer vision or machine vision that you've mm -hmm. gotten so drawn into AI that you may be too distracted with um, the technology and what you can do with the technology as opposed to the problem that you're solving for a specific customer or for a specific target audience in mind. So having product validation, do it really quickly. There are multiple ways like surveys, crowdsourcing, like pre-selling pre -selling something that's uh, getting money right away. It's always the uh, easiest way to uh, to do product market, uh, market validation and seeing if there is a product market fit for the offer that you have. And so, if there's a competitor, there that means there's a customer. Sorry, sorry, got to ask you. We both did a Kickstarter. <laughs> Tell me a little bit more about the Kickstarter. What go from the idea to the page of the launch page. What is the like one, two, three you did minimally in your head right now? So, you, yeah, yeah, so minimally, we we first we studied a bunch of Kickstarter pages and we saw that the biggest uh, difference is that a sizzle video, like a, a video that goes viral, basically. There that we shows go. You the, same, same. <laughs> that was the hardest thing ever. <laughs> yes. I got two million views on that one. That was hard. Yeah, exactly. And you're trying to learn how to ed edit videos and create. And your co-founders co are the, the stars of the video. So basically, just like at the same time of building the product, you have to learn how to talk to a camera and like sell your, your product to a wide audience. I, I <laughs> will see you viral. like this. So it's like, Hey, I want this angle exactly this way. Hey, hold on, hold on, hold on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. <laughs> but I did exactly so, that. I'm sorry guys. <laughs> so, so, I mean, I think one of the big success stories of doing that was, um, Dropbox, wasn't it? Um, you know, they got, I think it was, a, yeah, they got 150,000 registrations within hours. Um, for yeah. and it was just a video. They hadn't even started building. It was a video, yes, right? Yeah, and then, yeah, exactly. And then, and then they got yes. a huge investment and stuff. It really set the standard. Yeah, um, yeah. That's and, a big key, key takeaway too. Is 
validate before you even start building <laughs> because <Yeah>. if you <laughs> build they they wouldn't come <laughs> don't build and wait for them to come <laughs> we we, um, we in YC we have a way for it. We we call it, have you ever called and asked a person to install the tool and try it once? <laughs> yes. Right? Like uh, yeah, it's great. Like have anyone ever use it? It's like yeah. if you haven't answered the question. Exactly. I'm sorry guys. <laughs> but, but but then so then it goes to so the Dropbox story of um start with Slideware, go out as an MVP with that. And you know, it goes on to the books that we'll talk about later on with Lean Startup. Um go with your MVP. It could just be Slideware, validate your theory. Um, before you start even building your prototype, um, just to make sure that you're understanding the full package rather than being driven by technology for technology's sake, think about the actual use of it and the value that it's going to be. Because sometimes we make things um, that are technically amazing, but the cost just kills the value. So it's just too early. It's possibly a, we'll park that for a couple of years till the cost of the technology comes down. Yeah, but um, that's uh, in the startup school that we talked about. I think you yeah. can provide a link. How to learn, how to launch early and launch a lot of many times. It's okay to yeah. fail a launch, by the way, but it's not yeah, okay yeah, to exactly. like wait for a launch to fail. So it's yeah. a two different mentality, right? You see what I'm thinking? Like it's not okay to wait for that to fail, right? But if you yeah. people say it sucks, it's okay because you know at least you don't put in too yeah. much money and time. We've good. we've got a we've got a great question here from um, Rob uh, Risney. Um, let me just turn off the most successful so. machine. Mm. Vision. So, so that links to the question. I'd like to hear about what ideation strategies do you see as the way the most successful machine vision startups are using? How do you move from technology fantasy to something that creates real value that's worth something to someone? Uh, that's a really good question, Rob. Um, I think it, it goes down to um, building the technology from experience and the kind of way we like to work is we we understand the technology, we understand the tools, and we've been building tools to make it as easy as possible to adopt. And in parallel to that, we've been out validating with customers in specific verticals where we know that um, the, well, we've discovered from validation on understanding what the cost is to their business with doing our business as usual and how adopting the technology um, can enable and, and um, fix that by delivering value. Now, it could be cost saving, it could be create new business models. And that's about um, talking with customers and getting in front of the customers and having an open conversation about it. Um, guys, so. what's your thoughts? Yeah, I think so. You may have a lot of example for me. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So definitely talk to the practitioner, the person, the, the customer, meaning, for example, if you are creating a, a computer vision a use case for firefighters to to, to track how how massive the, the fire is going in the forestry like talk mm -hmm. to a firefighter or like a, a forestry management specialist like talk to the specialist in that field to see what is the real pain, pain point in their specific industry or vertical um, and i can tell you there's a lot of <clears throat> Uh, a lot of different use cases, whether it's in environmental sciences or machine vision um, in renewable energy that lacks the machine vision expertise that you all have now. And they are um, they are just looking for a solution that a lot of in a lot of cases there. Uh, it's probably more manual, a, a, a mm -hmm. more manual um, implementation. Um, mm -hmm. Think about um, what what those specific scenarios would be really dig into the key pain points that they have in the field uh, in practice and uh, and see what you can improve. Um, as Paul said, whether it's cost savings or efficiency and how you're doing processes, there's a lot of potential in there. It's just a lot. And it's just the, the matter of marrying the, the right technology will be the right use case and having that, uh, that validation. Just talk to the customer, talk to someone in that specific field. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then I have yeah. some answer for that type of problem because my whole augmented reality headset were a fantasy, first of all. Like when I did my Kickstarter, it was a fantasy. It was a prototype, right? And then to a shipping product, um, machine vision was like part of the system I was trying to build. Um, mm -hmm. One thing I learned about strategy-wise about building a startup around those type of problem, I would say my startup was very close to a computer vision company at that point because we focus a lot on the software side. So if you just like a hardware of an AR, no one wants to buy it. They want the whole mm -hmm. SDK. They want the whole, like, uh, like I thought about Slam, right? That time didn't even exist. So somehow when I was like strategizing that were at that time, at least for my company as a mm -hmm. startup is 
are you solving the problem that you can scale to many people that needs it? So when I think about two problems I'm trying to solve in AR, one is hand tracking, using a, you know the camera to look at where my fingers are because I need to touch the stuff. In AR, you mm -hmm. always, I did a user testing, it was crazy. Here's a headset, give it a try. The first thing they do, guess what they did? <laughs> Full of fingers. <laughs> Everyone's like, uh, I'm not ready. Like the button's right there. Uh, there's a keyboard here. It's like, uh, because they see it, they want to touch it, right? It's like everyone reaching out to the like thing. So my customer tells me, it's like, doesn't matter what you do, you put that headset in the head, the machine vision number one task, figure out where your fingers is. It's like, okay. <laughs> and step two, it's like, they stop moving. It's like, wait, 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 my wire, it's not done yet. <laughs> it's like, you stop moving around, trying to like reach over. The second problem is like, uh, we need to track the damn thing. Otherwise it will not work. So you, you, from my experience of demo, right? Giving out to the client to strategize, right? My strategy were, if I give it to people to try, what's the first one, two, three things? Always fails, always doesn't work. Always come back to you and bite you. So I end up putting a whole strategy around the company as a CTO say, no matter what, we have to have slam. No matter what, we have to have hand tracking. No matter what, the hardware has to work with no cable one day. <laughs> it's right. It's like, those are three biggest pain points in my life. And I spent four years to figure out. But at that time, at least I know, those are fundamental problems that worth pursuing. And then the whole company at the end, look at everyone, Magic Leap, HoloLens. We saw those similar trends. I think if you build a startup solving any one of those problems, mm -hmm. you'll be okay. You get values. Yeah. Very, thanks, I, I thanks would, for sharing, Raymond. Stuart. Yeah, yes, I Stuart. would look at uh, well, sort of more of what Zoe was saying. Um, if there's competition out there, and, and for us, the competition was GCC, so the, the GNU compiler. And what we were doing was making a better um, version than the GNU compiler. We were, our programs would run faster if they were going mm -hmm. to use our compiler. So we went out to, um, I would say, core travelers and we sold our tools through Wind River, Green Hills, all the embedded companies. Um, so they would pick it up and they would, no, we would sell a discount to them and they would take their cut. But the word would get out that this compiler was was better, because, and they were using it because it was better than the, the native GCC. So having um, having a decent <coughs> um, co travelers, if you can find somebody else to help, that mm -hmm. would be great. And then the the hiring and firing piece, um, we knew when we need, when we couldn't do what we could do, we couldn't sell, so we got a sales guy. We couldn't do marketing, we got a marketing person in. Um, the um, and ultimately, I mean, I was the techie guy. We got a techie guy in to crawl around on the floor and fix everybody's computers <laughs> rather than have me do that. Um, <laughs> so yeah, there Stealing. was, uh, yeah, there were definitely <clears throat> knowing when to, uh, when to expand and uh, you know, stick with what you know and get other yeah. people to help. Yeah, brilliant. Thanks for sharing, Stuart. My, quickly from my, my side is understanding your personas and you'll, you'll start to grow and understand and um, the more You'll understand that there's buyers and user differentiations and um, depend on the types of products. You know, if it's consumer product, the buyer is the buyer. But when you start moving into business stuff, there are a number of levels of buyers and influencers um, with it, which is where Devrel comes in quite interestingly. Um, so moving on to um, so, sort of uh, the, the baseline for your proposition when you're moving from prototype to startup, uh, one of the key things of having is a value proposition, understanding what your value proposition is and um, sharing that with your customers. Uh, having unfortunately having Shivy on the line today with us, um, he um, I was hoping he could share with us his value proposition for Zalient. Yeah, thanks, Paul. I'd be happy to, and I'll try and keep it short and sweet as well, given <laughs> the, the, the time. <laughs> so, so I guess I guess one way to frame things is the two biggest problems in computer vision are accuracy and efficiency, especially when you try to scale. And I think a common theme from listening to everyone else on the call is scale in, in all shapes and sizes. Mm. Now your brain has 600 million year old structure that filters information and highlights only the salient regions. This structure is about the size of a green pea, so it's super small. Um, coincidentally, that's why our company is called Zalient as well. Now, as you look around the room, your eyes will quickly point you to things that stand out. Uh, it's exactly this mechanism that allows us to see accurately and efficiently as humans. Now, Zalient is the first to reverse engineer this brain structure and turn it into a 44 kilobyte neural network that can run on any hardware and improves accuracy and efficiency of your own computer vision model. 
Um, it acts like kilo. a filter. Yeah, super smart, Why? right? Um, Why 44 acts, kilobyte? Well, that's that's what the model ended up being. That's the, <laughs> that's the, that's the, that's the tensile light model. Sorry, it's funny. So let's keep going. Sorry. All right, cool. And I'll probably explain it in a second, right? So um, it acts like a filter by processing raw images from a camera and then passes only the regions of interest in a higher resolution to your AI. So I'm guessing a lot of people listening might be using things like YOLO or SSD, et cetera. So this is sort of like a, a filter that processes the raw images from the camera and sends just the regions of interest in higher resolution to your AI. So you can it's intuitive that you get better accuracy this way. And because these are higher resolution, your AI model performs a lot better. Now, mm -hmm. um, to answer Ray's question, it's a 44 kilobyte model compared to a 200 megabyte YOLO model. So that's 5,000 times smaller. Cool. So I see. So, so I, I guess to... I guess a long a long story short, in terms of value proposition, if your models are not generalizing well, then train a forty four kilobyte filter on our website to improve your model's generalizability. What's the role in your company? I think we missed. Oh, I'm the just... I'm the CTO and co-founder. Oh my God, we were the CTO. Oh, I know how hard your life is now. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I'm sorry, man. I'm empathize. so sorry for this. <laughs> It's a hard life. There we go. It, it's that's been it. a hard life for eighteen months. That's how. That's how. Eighteen young months. We are. Oh, you have a long yeah. way to go. Don't worry. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> Not until that's the money, right. right? Remember the money you talked about. Yeah. Okay. That's great. Brilliant. Uh, and I th uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the the positioning there sort of covers across on your elevator pitch as well. The way that you've positioned um, exactly. that information to us all. Yes. Br Brilliant. Thanks very much for sharing, Shivian. It's been a pleasure having you on the show. Not that we're going just yet. Um, we'll move into resources <laughs> now. Um, and let's have a chat about uh, books that um, we would recommend. Uh, there are some of us that love love books and love uh, books for reference, and there's some of us that don't. But um, I think it's really key to have, you know, there's going to be times when you think, um, when you're making this progression and transition, where do I turn to for this? So here's some um, um, help from us all. Um, my my one of my favorites and it was a bible for a while um, is the lean startup by eric reese he also has the startup way which is about using moving this into um corporate as well very very insightful book and great um to uh use as insight and reference um a value proposition from the strategizer series um you know help, helping you put together your value proposition and your value proposition design your business model generation and testing business ideas absolutely great reference books um, and I highly recommend um, those, to take, those to take a look at. A recent one that I've come across, which is by a guy called Alan Dibb. Um, suddenly, I've, it's one of those books that I've discovered everybody's reading. It's like, what, you haven't read it yet? Um, it's called The One Page Marketing Plan. Um, here is literally The One Page Plan. Uh, luckily, it's not a one-page book. Um, the, there are a few chapters which help you understand the three streams and the nine blocks there. Definitely worth a read. It really helps you simplify your marketing um, if you're not um, uh, a trend in marketing phase. Zoe, let's move on to your books and with uh, The Dip. Yeah, um, the first one I, I'd recommend is The Dip by Seth Godin. Um, this talks about how certain companies go into this dip where they start kind of on a high and then and, and on the dip. Um, and and you probably know, you, you'll hear more about um, race uh, stories. <laughs> um, and oftentimes startups have this dip where after they got, get into this high of like everything is new and, and nice and shiny, you get into this dip of everything is going wrong. <laughs> yeah. And uh, but you have to realize that it comes with the uh, with being in, the, in uh, an entrepreneur or being in a startup that there's mm -hmm. going to be a dip. And, but if you overcome these hurdles of uh, getting your first customer or getting your first prototype out there, um, you're going to see um, an up, uh, upturn uh, from then on. But realize that there's always going to be a dip. Uh, whether it's your first customer, first 10 customers, it's all right, there's going to be a dip and uh, be cognizant about that. The second one, or <laughs> the other three <laughs> ones, <laughs> um, is uh, my, um, the first one is my book that I, I launched <laughs> this year. I, I will highlight <laughs> here, I put this book in the list for Zoe because I think she needs to talk about it because it is brilliant. It's not fair. I have a book Thank too. I have you. a textbook, guys. I have a textbook. I have a textbook, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Raymond, I do not. <laughs> okay, so tell us about Unlearn, Zoe. 
Um, I'll talk about Unlearned Dogma. And this is not necessarily a startup or entrepreneurship skill or uh, um, book or reference book, but it's more of a transferable lifelong skill. You've got to rethink values or uh, dogmas that, that you may have over and over again. Uh, whether you're doing a startup or whether you're in a company, um, you have to always keep shifting your mindset into what you have previously believed in. And so that's what the book is all about. And I have a feeling it's going to help you as well in rethinking your market validation or who your customers are. And it's just a, a transferable, transferable lifelong skill to keep unlearning and rethinking dogmas or old beliefs that that you may have had in the in the past. Uh, thank you, Paul, for adding that. <laughs> <laughs> zero to one. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, zero to one. Um, I think a lot of start uh, entrepreneurs uh, read this is from Peter Thiel. Some of the learnings from PayPal, and essentially, it's more about um, how how you could scale from zero to one, prototype to production, or uh, production to scale. So, highly recommend this um, once you're getting into thinking about scaling um, from zero to one, and then change by design. Um, I heard Ray talk about uh, one of the the fundamentals. Uh, fundamental technical design uh, principles that he had in for Meta was no wires, um, and why why is that? So you can if you don't have any user experience or user interaction background, this book is uh, really informative in how you could design intuitive experiences that users can get right away. Um, and there are a lot of human psychology that goes into designing that something that is intuitive, and this is um, using principles from ideal uh, design thinking and and this is it goes into designing products but also designing companies and team culture and organizations so highly recommend this one as well brilliant thank you Zoe. shivy you've got a couple of books that you would like to share uh yes i do so one of my favorites and very very popular sort of like a bible in the startup world is the hard things about the hard things uh and that's by ben horowitz and um, this book is pretty much um, just like a, a stretched out nightmare, right? <laughs> of, of pretty much everything that could possibly go wrong in startups um, is pretty much revealed. So it's like you're reading almost like a fiction nightmare here, but uh, it's really some great tips, a lot of consolation for people that are facing similar issues. I think once you read this, it will make you want to push on and not give up because it makes you realize that pretty much every other startup out there is facing these same problems. So that's the hard thing about the hard things, highly recommend it. And the other one that I think is pretty cool is the five dysfunctions of a team. So I think, you know, you've got, you know, you've, you've obviously got your technical challenges and you've got your sales channel challenges, but then there are also social challenges and psychological challenges that, that, have sometimes a bigger impact on the success of a startup, right? And so I, I think I read a statistic somewhere that around 60% of startups fail because the founders mm -hmm. fall out, right? And so this is a great book to sort of help strengthen the, the founding team and also the team itself. Um, it talks about the five things being trust, building trust between each other, uh, mastering conflict, um, mm -hmm. you know, handling feedback well, commitment, accountability, and then, you know, how everyone can focus on results. But I think this one definitely addresses the social side of, of building a team from, from zero to one. Brilliant. Thanks for sharing on that. Um, no I think the, the, the last thing to move on to um, is about tools to use when you're making that transition. So one of the things that a lot of people forget about is a CRM system. There's a great offering from a company called HubSpot, hubspot.com. Um, there's um, an awful lot of um, technology there for free to help you be organized, connect with your customers, leverage marketing, utilizing landing pages. It is an extremely powerful tool, but not only do that, that but they also um, have you um, educated with the, um, uh, the, the courses on there as well. Great templates to use for your marketing, planning, um, press releases, all sorts of stuff. It's just a wealth of, um, of support and intelligence for startups. And, and scale ups as well. Um, another tool that I personally really like is Trello, keeping me organized in pretty much everything. I've even started using it in my personal life. Um, that, that again, free. Um, you can um, have power ups to do more complex stuff and automation. 
but the free version is absolutely brilliant as well. Uh, Shiva, you've got quite a, a thing. You like uh, Asano, Asana, sorry, which is um, kind of similar, isn't it? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, we, we're definitely um, pretty fond of Asana, Asana and the team. Uh, we, we use it for, for many things. Um, it's got a pretty uh, good evolving base of features as well. Brilliant. Uh, guys, do you have any other suggestions for um, tools to use? I use all of those in my life. <laughs> <laughs> different time of life, you use different things, though. Like, I, I don't know. I, I think Paul and I had that long discussion why I don't read as much books during the CTO role when I was doing my startup. So I'm a notebook guy. <laughs> fair play, fair play. There is also a lot of audio books and TED.com talks and stuff as well. They're always great to um, search and find relevance to them. Uh, Danny, uh, I founded a startup in the IoT field when IoT was not widely known here at the time, 2012 in Indonesia. I was not very successful at that time. Looks like timing is very important. Totally agree with you. Hey, guys, we're, we're well and truly overrunning by 15 minutes, <laughs> nearly 16 minutes. This has been an extremely entertaining and um, fun show to do. I, I really appreciate everybody joining, especially Shivy, who it's probably close to 3 a.m. for him now. So I do apologize for keeping you up so late. Um, but I, I you know, truly appreciate you joining us. Uh, Raymond, Stuart, Zoe, Shivy, thanks very much for your time. Um, if you found this helpful, please do comment on the uh, social profile that you're on. If you'd like us to do some more, um, I'm more than happy to organize them and support you in this transition. Yeah. Thanks very much. We can do a round okay. two, guys, if you like it enough. We have like a thousand views. Yeah. I don't know. Something like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, for, for sure. So round, round two, do hashtag 2020 vision hack on either Twitter or um, LinkedIn. Um, and um, put round two. So hashtag 2020 vision hack, next words, round two, and we'll do a round two. Thanks very much, guys, and um, speak to you soon.